You know you've reached your breaking point when you come to a bunch of strangers asking for help. Well, I'm at my limit. I've had little sleep. It's been over 24 hours since the incident happened, and my husband and I still have no idea what to do or how this even started. I'm laying on the floor now, my eyes bloodshot and weary from crying. I'm holding my little girl up as she leans against the hallway wall and continues to sob in pain. She's been having fits of pain more frequently for the past few hours, and I still don't have a solution for her. All I know for sure is that I take any suggestions possible. I ruffled her hair and soothingly whispered to her, trying to get her to calm down, but it isn't working. Nothing we've done has worked so far, either. When I first heard her screams yesterday, I thought for sure it was a problem with one of her toys getting lost. Instead, I turned the corner from the laundry room to see that she was against the wall, desperately trying to tug her arm from the plasterboard. At first, I thought somehow or another she had ripped a hole, and I was about to scold her. As I got closer, I was shocked to find that instead, it seemed as though her entire hand and up to the middle of her arm was somehow meshed with the wall. It was impossible to determine where one end and the other began. Okay, okay, sweetie, calm down, calm down. I told her as she started to have a crying fit and kept tugging. It hurts, she screamed. I could tell her efforts weren't making any difference, though. I, so I immediately distracted her with something else so I could get a closer look. It wasn't easy. She was fidgety and... Any sudden movement I was worried would make the situation worse. Even after an hour, I couldn't find a way to pry her arm from the wall, so I immediately called my husband at work and told him what was happening. Should I call the paramedics? I asked. He suggested trying to rub some coconut oil on her arm and try letting it slip out. Then I sent him a snapshot of the way the wall basically was part of her arm now. And he immediately called. I'll come home right away. Get 911, he said. I never heard him so alarmed, but maybe it's because I'm normally the panicky one. All I could think about was how scared my little girl was. I soothed her and let her watch some videos on her tablet as we waited for the EMT to arrive. When they got there, however, our troubles were far from over. There were three of them, and from the looks of their faces, I could tell none of them had ever seen anything like this. We need to check her vitals first. The oldest on the team decided as I squeezed my daughter's free hand and tried to tell her it was going to be okay, but any reassuring words I had were falling on deaf ears. She just continued to sob bitterly and tell us how much it hurt. Hey there, what's your name? The lady EMT asked, getting at eye level. Marcy? My six-year-old stammered. Hey Marcy, I know it's scary, but we're going to take care of you, okay? And when this is over, if you're a good girl, maybe your mommy will let you have some candy. She suggested. I nodded, and I kissed her forehead as the other EMTs worked around the awkward standing position that we were in to check everything out. Pulse is elevated. Nothing appears to be broken. Ma'am, what's behind the wall? The team leader asked, but my attention was focused on Marcy. The short reprieve that we had to calm her down was over as she screamed and said something was squeezing her arm. It got louder when she saw her daddy walking in the room. Sir, please back up woman EMT advised. I'm her father, Stan. Please tell me you've come up with something. What's causing this? He asked as he rushed and kissed me and then checked on Marcy. The other EMT talked in between her bursts of tears. Well, honestly, I can't say for sure, but it seems like the best option right now would be to tear the wall down. Stan boated eagerly as he rubbed Marcy's arm, trying to soothe her pain. Yeah, oh yeah, of course. You have my permission. Tear it all down, he demanded. The EMTs radioed for a fire station nearby to bring a sledgehammer. Stan and I just kept holding our little girl tight, not daring to say a word as they returned with the equipment. Please step aside, one firefighter ordered us. I didn't want to be away from her as it happened, but I knew not to disobey, so I quietly stood up and watched as they prepared to smash the wall. As soon as they began to slam the hammer into the wall, we were all surprised to hear Marcy scream even louder. I thought she might even go deaf from the noise. As they hit the hammer again, nothing seemed to damage the wall. Instead, it only seemed to make Marcy shriek and cry and even twist her arm to the point of nearly breaking it to get away. Still, she remained lodged in place and I, I couldn't be quiet any longer. You're hurting her, I screamed as I motioned for the EMTs to stop. Jesus, it's like the foundation's thicker than concrete, they said. Is there no other way? Stan asked. 
The team consulted amongst themselves for a few minutes as I wiped away Marcy's tears. They asked to talk to Stan privately. For a moment I heard her get upset and I cringed, wondering what their suggestion even was. Then he returned to the hall and asked to talk to me while the EMTs did their best to distract our daughter. They, uh... They... They want to amputate, he said with a stone face. I could see the tears that had streaked down his face when he had been arguing with them. I knew that if he were coming to me now, it meant that he didn't see any other option. They can't. No, she's... She's just a little girl, I said, as I covered my mouth, tried not to hyperventilate. Listen to me. Listen. Can I just... He said as he grabbed my shoulder. They said that we could think it over, and that they would consider other options too, but it's not looking good. Not the way it's lodged in there, he told me. I shook my head, trying to think about it. I knew that he was also struggling with this choice as well. So we told them, we told them that we would call them back in a few hours. I sat down on the floor beside Marcy as she complained about her feet getting tired from standing and told her that she could rest on me as I rubbed her arm tiredly. It hurts so much, Mommy, she complained with a whimper. She was all worn out. I don't know how, but we got some sleep. Then, this morning... I decided I couldn't bear to hear her in pain any longer, so I asked Stan to call the EMTs back. How will they do it? I asked as he got off the phone. They didn't specify. I can only imagine that we don't want to know the details, he said as he grabbed me. Then we got on the floor next to Marcy and he tried to explain to her what was about to happen. Sweetie, do you remember the men and women who came yesterday to look at your arm? Stan asked. She nodded weakly. I could tell she had barely gotten any sleep herself. They're coming back now. I mean, to try to get you out, but... Sweetie, what they're going to do, it's... It's, it's going to hurt. Would you be brave for Mommy and Daddy, though? He asked. She whimpered, unsure of how to respond. We held her close. Stan even said a prayer, and we all huddled together until the team arrived. When they did, Marcy was desperate for us to not leave her side as I watched the EMTs get out some syringes and anesthetic to numb the area closest to the wall. We'll get everything set up, tie her arm off right above the elbow to limit blood flow. Then, once the medicine's in her system, we'll try to make it a, a clean cut, the team told me. I was visibly shaking. I can't even describe the way that Marcy screamed as they stuck her with about five different needles. Then it was time to operate. The two EMTs moved to either side of her arm with a bone saw and asked me and Stan to hold her still as they prepared to make the cut. I immediately fell to my knees and squeezed her other hand. Marcy, look at me, baby, look at me. I want you to think about your favorite ice cream, okay? I said as they activated the blade and she whimpered and her lower lip quivered. Mommy, I'm scared. Please don't let them hurt me, she begged. I touched her cheek and cried alongside her as the blade hit the edge of her arm and I heard the loudest noise imaginable from the machinery. But Marcy's high-pitched wail was even louder. They immediately stopped and Stan rushed over, all of us surprised to find out that somehow... Her skin... had managed to break the bone saw. What in the world? Stan sat. They had to try again. They tried three times, each time, only causing more damage to the saw than any progress on Marcy's arm. And finally, they admitted they couldn't try any longer. They left muttering apologies and promising they would call back as soon as another solution presented itself. And that was over six hours ago. We haven't had a call back. Stan has taken off work, but he's no closer to a solution. We tried to bust down the wall from outside of the house, but no such luck from that either. I'm at the edge of my rope. I've done my best to keep Marcy well fed and dry, but I don't know how much longer this will go on. I'm, I'm asking anyone. Please. Help us. Help my little girl. Help.
Something changed about four hours after I posted. Stan ran out to buy a soft beanbag chair for Marcy to be able to rest in. I bit my nails and waited by the phone for another call for the EMT. Their suggestions weren't bad, but each one of them sounded more gruesome and torturous than the one prior to it. Acid or maybe some sort of explosive, they said. They made me physically shake to imagine doing that to my little girl. I was tired and exhausted, but I... I still had some sanity left to know that I didn't want to make my little girl be in any more pain, especially now that her screams had mostly turned into whimpers as she rested and even cried pitifully in her sleep. I stepped away from her for a minute or two, just to regain some sense of composure, and checked all the suggestions that folks posted here. I mean, some of it was quite appalling, suggesting that we kill her to save her the pain, but others suggested that we should attempt a cut from further away up her arm. Someone said it so well. A whole arm amputation beat her current predicament. I showed my husband the suggestions and he agreed with the logic, so I went back to Marcy to make her comfortable as we made the call. That was when I noticed that it was no longer just the lower part of her arm that was stuck. Now the wall was connected directly at the arm right beneath her shoulder. She was being pulled further in. I covered my mouth to stifle a scream, and I rushed to get Stan, and when he came and he saw what happened, he made a few quick decisions. Don't wake her, she's not in pain right now, and maybe that's a good thing, we can get this over with before it sucks her even further inside, he suggested, and I nodded, trying not to panic as I paced the kitchen, but the hospital wasn't responding. The one nurse that we did finally get a hold of thought that we were pulling some kind of prank and hung up. What are we supposed to do? I asked Stan, as we consulted in the living room. I'm not sure, but I think right now we both need some sleep. As cruel as it sounds, there's nothing we can do for her at the moment. And maybe, with some good rest, we can clear our heads and get some better ideas. He suggested. I don't want to leave her alone, I admitted, as I started down the hall where our little girl was resting on the beanbag. She looked like a little rag doll, limp, but hanging by some invisible thread on the side of her body. We can take shifts. You need rest. Stan insisted, and then went to lay down alongside her as I covered my mouth again and tried to calm down. He was right. I knew that I needed to take a break from this insanity. So I went to grab a hot shower and then climbed into bed. But sleep was nearly impossible as I thought about Marcy and how it could be at any time that the wall might decide to pull her in further. Somehow or another, though. I got a few hours. In the morning, my husband did have a more leveled head, and we stood there watching her sleep and make soft coos of pain. And he whispered, What was she doing before this happened, anyway? I rubbed my eyes tiredly and realized I never really gotten a chance to ask her. I was sorting laundry and I heard her scream, I admitted. He nodded, and then went back to the kitchen to check his smartphone. I called Tim last night about possibly coming over to knock the wall down since it seemed like the area closest to her is what was making it painful. Figured we got far enough out and we'd start from there, he said, then added, if that doesn't work, I might be able to drill under the house. I was focused on Marcy, though. See, I, I realized she was waking up, so I nodded absently at my husband's ideas and put all my attention on her. Hey, hey, baby girl. You okay? I asked, getting on my knees as she opened her sleepy eyes. She looked at me confused, perhaps thinking the whole ordeal had been a bad dream. Then she turned to see the wall was now right against her body, and she began to whimper again. Mommy, what's happening? She asked desperately. It's okay. You don't feel any pain, do you? I asked, as I clenched her other hand. No, just... It feels really numb and tingly, she admitted. I then remembered that the paramedics said the local anesthetic they used would be wearing off after about a day, so the fact that she was still feeling something made me instantly nervous. Stan had checked the exterior of the house. Our walls aren't too thick, so there couldn't possibly be over nine feet between the interior of the hallway to the edge of the house where she was trapped, but we hadn't been able to see anything, so 
Where exactly was she feeling the pain at now? It's going to be okay. Uncle Tim is going to come over and see what we can do to help, I told her. She nodded and asked if I could make her some breakfast. Doing the simple routine task seemed like the best way for me to keep my mind off my little girl's plight. I slowly washed the dishes and daydreamed about anything besides the wall. Eventually, Tim arrived, and as soon as he jumped inside, he got a good look at the wall and Marcy. Hey, kiddo, he said, smiling, and offering Marcy a small trinket as a distraction while he got a better look. This is crazy, he admitted as he finished his examination, and we all worried about what the next few hours might mean for Marcy. Tim had brought a heavy-duty saw from the back of his truck and set it up at the edge of the hall where the wall met the door of the laundry room. Stan got an extension cord and they got set up as I distracted Marcy. I'm not scared, Mommy. I just want to go play in my room, she admitted. Tom started up the saw and approached the wall. He was at least four feet away, but as soon as the saw touched the wall, Marcy's calm demeanor fractured into more pain. Stop, 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 I yelled. But the noise was too loud and Tom was wearing protective ear guards. Somehow, though, he managed to hear Marcy's piercing screams as he instantly shut the equipment off. Shit, she okay? He asked as he removed his eye gear. Marcy was shaking again, clenching her other fist and squeezing her side so hard that it was leaving a bruise. I tried to get her to tell me where it hurt. She was a loss for words. Okay, we, we have to try something else. Hitting the wall is no good, Stan said. If we can get those damn paramedics back here, maybe we could apply some stronger anesthetic from this side, Tim suggested, as he checked Marcy's free arm. While she was distracted with the pain, he made a small cut with his pocket knife against her palm. And I slapped him away. What's wrong with you? Are you trying to make her worse? Relax, it's just to test a theory. You said near to the wall she couldn't be hurt. But look on this side. She could still bleed, he said, gesturing to the successful cut. That it's all the way up to her fucking shoulder, Tim. Where the hell would we be able to cut? I screamed back. He raised his hands defensively and muttered, All right, all right, amputation's off the table right now. Let's try the other thing. Drill from underneath. Stan seemed to agree that it was a good idea, so the two of them left the house while I worked frantically to calm my little girl down. She was so tired and worn out from everything that it didn't take as long. As I sang a lullaby to her and let her rest her head against me, she looked up at me, and she mumbled, Mommy, I'm scared. Am I going to be stuck like this forever? I rubbed her back and smiled, tears welling up in my eyes. I... I didn't know, but I lied to her. No, baby, Uncle Tim and Daddy are going to get you out, I assured her. I could hear the two of them crawling underneath the house, we lived in an area that's at the bottom of a hill, so the crawl space is mostly designed for water that trickles down to flow through and go into a nearby ditch. In other words, I knew that Tim and Stan were likely on their backs struggling in muck and dirt to search for the right spot to drill. I'm sorry, Mommy, Marcy said, as I went to the nearest vent on the floor to talk to Stan. It's okay, honey, it's not your fault, I told her. She was whimpering again, but not out of pain. This time, she was scared. I recognized it as the face she usually made when she thought she was going to get in trouble. Stan was telling me something about how I would need to send the drill down through the vent, along with a cord. But my attention was focused on what Marcy was trying to tell me. Baby, why do you think you're in trouble? I asked her as she squirmed uncomfortably. Now with 90% of her arm in the wall, it was nearly impossible to get her into a position that wasn't going to hurt, even with something to rest on. What were you doing before this happened? I asked. Guilt was written all over my face. I'm sorry, I I didn't know, she admitted. She looked panicked. No, no, sweetie, it's okay, you aren't in trouble, I told her. I, 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 I was drawing on the wall, she sobbed. For some reason, the way she said it made me feel a cold shiver run up and down my spine. It's okay, baby, I said with a soft, small voice. It's gonna be okay, you're not in trouble, I told her. But I really think she is. I'm about to send the drill down to Stan and Tim. But my gut's telling me that it won't work. My gut's telling me... That there is something very wrong with this house.
It's been quite a while since I've touched a bottle of alcohol. I had a problem when I was younger, but I kicked the habit when I found out I was pregnant. I swore I would never have a drop of the stuff again, but now it's been three days and there isn't a hope in sight for my daughter. If you're catching this for the first time, the problem started on Friday. Marcy was drawing on the wall in the back hallway of the three-bedroom house and then suddenly she was unable to remove her right hand from the wall. Since that time, we've tried every method known to science. It's left my husband stand and I feeling rather desperate. It got so bad after we called Tim, her uncle, we resorted to drilling from the crawl space under the house. Despite the impossibility of it, I can't deny what I'm witnessing any longer. It does seem like she's being absorbed by the house. That was further confirmed when Tim and Stan tried the drill, and after lowering it through the vent, followed by the extension cord, I told the boys to give it a shot and held Mercy as close as possible as the machinery was activated. For a moment, I thought it was working. She wasn't screaming. She seemed to be distracted by the hum. And then it hit the foundation of the house. Mercy let out a wail so loud I thought it might burst my eardrums. Instantly, I signaled for the two of them to stop. They hadn't even made a dent in the foundation, and it was actually causing her more harm. Once Tim and Stan were back inside, the two of them checked on Marcy first, before deciding to go to the den and try to solve this. Somehow I managed to calm her down long enough for me to join them. Anywhere close to her is hurting her physically, so let's try going further and further out in the house. There's bound to be somewhere that doesn't affect her. So maybe we start from there and work our way towards her, Stan suggested. I could tell he was stressed more than ever. He had called into work these past few days to try to help. His job had even called several times yesterday to ask when he would be returning, and he offered a flimsy excuse. But it's not like that he can just ignore bills forever. I think you should contact the medium. I know you've posted it on the internet, so what's the harm there? Tim suggested. I don't want a bunch of quacks coming in and treating her like some kind of experiment, I said angrily. I didn't want to admit that I almost considered posting a video of Marcy's predicament earlier. I couldn't press the button, though. It didn't seem right. This was my child, not some kind of work of art or freak show. I didn't know what sort of attention that kind of post would attract. I turned back to my phone as the two men talked and reviewed some more of the outlandish theories, and surprisingly... The only sanity I found has been to come online and check the suggestions made. I mean, they didn't seem so bizarre anymore. Many of them were practical, like attempting to cut away at the wall from a further and further distance. And that sounded like what Tim had just said. But we soon found out that just about anywhere in the house, when we did something, it was causing pain to our little girl. Even the simplest thing like flicking the light switch on and off, she said it felt like a shock. Eventually... Stan and Tim agreed that they needed to test to see what else did and did not affect Marcy, so they went to different parts of the house to try other things. Meanwhile, I sat a chair alongside her beanbag, and I prepared her. Uncle Tom and Daddy are going to see if they can help you, but it's going to take a lot of trial and error, sweetie, I told her. She seemed numb now, so tired from pain that she barely registered the words I was saying. I sobbed and I held her wishing that this damn house would take me instead of her. Tim started in the bathroom and turned to the sink. Marcy said that it felt like she was swimming and that it was hard to breathe. Stan went to the living room and turned on the TV. Marcy knew what show was playing, even though she was down at the end of the hall and it was muted. We decided to limit our use of anything in the house, not knowing what could or could not affect her. Tim made a few calls to some nurses he knew over at the local ER. The stuff the EMTs gave her was probably not nearly strong enough. If we're going to do this, she needs to be out cold, he told me. Stan and I were too tired to argue. A few hours later, his friend arrived and examined our little girl like she was some kind of specimen, asking us all kinds of questions we'd already been asked a thousand times. I was already concluding in my mind that this wasn't going to work. There's not much room to work with here the nurse admitted, and she tried to numb the little portion of skin on Marcy's arm that was still outside the wall, between her arm and the shoulder. But the needles weren't working. Most of that part of her body now seemed impenetrable. Instead, she resorted to setting up an IV on Marcy's left arm, and gave her a few general antibiotics and morphine, as Tim searched desperately online for what sort of anesthetic could do the trick. 
Even if you do get her sedated, how would you even amputate at this point? You would have to cut from the neck down, I said angrily. You have a better idea? The nurse snapped back. We aren't dealing with anything natural. So, it's not going to be solved by natural means. I think we need to consider calling a priest or something, I admitted. Stan was nearby, pouring some coffee. And he nodded absently. I guess I... It wouldn't hurt at this point, he admitted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, let's look in the yellow pages under Exorcist, the nurse said, rolling her eyes and crossing her arms. I was about to snap back at her for her attitude when I heard Marcy making some more whimpering sounds. I went to check on her. Stan was right beside me. We now saw that her arm was completely sucked in, along with a portion of her shoulder. She was gripping my hand with her left one hard, and she told us how badly it hurt. I want to let go of me she said. Stan's face hardened, and he stood up before going to grab his coat. What are you doing? I asked. Off to find a priest. There's bound to be someone that'll listen to me, he said. Tim and his friends were finishing up the next round of drugs, and Marcy complained about the needles. Every time they stick me, it makes me hurt more in there, she complained. I touched her cheek softly and kissed her forehead. I know, baby girl, I know. It's going to hurt before it gets better, I said. But Tim wasn't feeling as sympathetic. He held Marcy still as his friend prepared the next round of general anesthetic. Nothing seemed to be making her sleep, though. And the more she was poked and prodded, the more she complained about the wall squeezing her arm tighter and tighter. It was a wonder that she could feel anything at all. Just get out! You've done more harm than good, I screamed at them. Tim apologized for his friend, and the two of them scurried away. I kept rocking her, trying to make sense of this nightmare. You should be glad I even came to help, the nurse shouted as she left the house. Tim muttered another apology and followed after her. Then, just as I was ready to pass out myself, Stan came home, and he wasn't alone. The man that came with him did not look like a traditional Catholic priest. He was wearing just some khaki pants and a button-down white shirt that wasn't completely ironed. It looked like Stan probably caught him at a bad time because when he arrived, he didn't seem too happy with being there. As he got closer, his eyes narrowed, and he examined Marcy closely. It was almost infuriating to see yet another person scrutinize our child and treat her like an object. I must admit, I've never seen anything like this, he said. Can you help us or not? Stan said in a cold tone. I could tell that he had likely gotten a few negative responses from his search. I can do my best, the priest said, as he went back outside, and then returned a moment later with a small bag. He laid it down around nine feet for Marcy, and then took out a few simple supplies. He first took out a long bundle of sage leaves and stems that were tied together, and then took out a few bottles of crystal clear water. He instructed us to wait outside the house as he began to gently pour the water around the spot where Marcy was stuck. I hesitated, not wanting to leave my little girl, but I understood the stakes and promptly let it go to stand in the yard. Stan and I stood there holding each other for the next 20 minutes or so, waiting for some signal that it was okay to come back inside. And the longer we waited, the more uneasy I felt. Was this man really here to help our daughter? What if, what if he was a molester or something? And now, did we even know if he was really doing anything helpful or not? Suddenly, a shrill noise burst through my thoughts. It was a smoke alarm. Stan ran in to shut it off, and I wasn't far behind him. Open all the windows, he told me hastily, as I ran amid the smoky hallway to grab hold of Marcy. Are you okay? I asked her, touching her face. It was hard for me to really see her expression, but she nodded silently as I went to the other windows to ventilate the house. Once the smoke was starting to clear, I could tell what had happened as the priest had lit the sage on fire and then dropped it on the ground for whatever reason. Jesus Christ, Stan said as he waved the smoke away and tried to find the priest. But he was nowhere in sight. I turned my attention to Marcy to make sure that she was okay. Then I let out a louder scream. I didn't think it was possible, but it was now somehow worse. Part of her face was molded into the wall up to the edge of her right eye and her lower chest as well. Baby, are you okay? Did that man do something to you? I screamed as I squeezed her hand. She was sobbing again and looked around frantically. It was clear she was panicking because she couldn't turn her head. 
I don't know what happened, Mommy. He was chanting something and talking funny, and then he began to strike the wall, and I, I felt dizzy when he did that. I was scared. He was a scary man, she admitted. Stan checked the rest of the house, but there was no sign of the priest anywhere. I slumped against the wall, feeling deflated and defeated. There was one thing of significance, though. The one spot where Marcy had said the priest had been striking the wall felt a little different. It felt... warm. I don't know exactly when we went past our breaking point. Was it when this all started? Or when things got worse? Either way, it happened. There isn't much else I can describe about what's transpired here after the incident with the priest, other than a complete and total loss of sanity. I think I was the first one to really lose it. Lack of sleep, trying to keep Marcy as comfortable as possible, and trying to keep a straight face myself despite the circumstances were likely the main cause. But the moment that really made me start to question everything was around lunchtime yesterday. I've had to resort to a liquid diet for Marcy because of the way that she's fused to the wall. She could only barely open her mouth on the left side, and I'm feeding her with a straw. For the most part, when this happens, she's quiet and cooperative because she's hungry. But yesterday... Yesterday something different happened. Mommy, why did they do it? She whispered as she took another sip from the hot broth. Do what, sweetie? I asked. The walls... They changed the color. Why did they change the color? I frowned and ran the back of my palm against her forehead to check if she had a fever. And I muttered, Baby, what are you talking about? In the, the upstairs bedroom. And they covered it up. I don't know why they did it, she complained. She seemed tired, so I kissed her head and told her I was going to take a nap. Stan came to be beside her as I gently walked up the stairs, pondering over what she had told me. Eventually, I found myself standing outside of Stan's office the upstairs bedroom that Marcy had been talking about. As I stared into the room, I thought back to when we first bought this house. The realtor had suggested that if we ever wanted to expand our family, that the room could be a great nursery. Why had she said that? I stepped into the room and stared at the walls, the patterns that were decorating them, before finally deciding to rip it all off. As I began to tear it down, I heard sharp sounds from downstairs. Then Stan was running up the stairs like a wild man. The fuck are you doing? He said as he burst into the room. I kept stripping off the wallpaper and ignoring him as he grabbed my hand and forced me to look at him face to face. Have you lost your mind? While you're here dismantling the house, our little girl is downstairs crying because she said she feels it, like you're peeling her skin off. We agreed not to do anything like this. I pulled away from him and said in a shaky voice, what else am I supposed to do? I'm trying to figure out what this fucking house wants. It's not like I can I can talk to the walls. Stan relaxed and held me for a moment as I broke down and dropped some of the wallpaper I was holding. I'm sorry. I'm, I overreacted. I'm sure whatever you're doing was intended to help her, he admitted as he squinted his eyes and looked past me on the wall. He let go of me for a moment and went toward it, gently peeling the wallpaper off to reveal what appeared to be a measuring chart of some kind. What is that? He asked. I examined it as well and realized it was the scribblings of a child's hand on the wall with the name Jasper Hunt, age 10. Did you know that was back there? Stan asked. I shook my head and replied, Marcy was talking about it like she knew, but... I don't see how that's possible. He examined it closely, and I could see his brain firing to figure out what to do with this new information. Unless we really can talk to the walls, he realized. Do you think the house is the one that was speaking to me? I whispered. It sounded ridiculous to say, but given all that we had experienced, we couldn't rule anything out. I think he's trying to tell us something. Stan paused. As he moved over to his desk and began to rifle through some files. What are you looking for? He slammed it closed and muttered to himself. Thought I kept the info on the real estate agent. 
Damn, I can't find it anywhere. It was Samantha something, I chimed in. Although my brain was so tired, I couldn't imagine where he was going with this. He paused and he kissed my cheek and said, I'm going to try and Google the info and get them on the phone. Maybe find out who the previous owners of the house were. Okay, what, what do you want me to do? I asked. He rubbed his chin for a moment, then directed me towards the stairs. Keep Marcy talking. If the house can tell us anything else, you can help us get her out, he demanded. I nodded. Sprinting down the stairs to where my little girl was whimpering and pulling her shirt up a tad to scratch at her belly. As I got closer, I could tell she was developing a, a rash of some kind. Hey, baby, are you okay? I said as I sat alongside her. Mommy, why do you keep hurting me? She asked as tears streamed down her face. She could barely even get the words out. Just to hear her say that made me feel like I wanted to die. I, I touched her cheek and smiled gently. Oh, no, baby, no. We don't want to hurt you. We want to help you. I I found what was under the walls. It was another little boy who used to live here and draw on the walls, too, I said. Did the walls eat him, too? She asked anxiously. I didn't know the answer to that question, and the fact that she asked it made me even more terrified. I bit my lip and I came up with a lie, wondering when the house would use our daughter to speak next. No, baby, he's okay. His name was Jasper. I'm sure his family moved before we came here, I said softly. Well, why is he eating me? Marcy asked, fumbling to find the words as she looked at the wall. I'm sorry, she said with trembling lips as she touched the wall with her free hand. Stan was at the edge of the hall with a grim look on his face that told me he had bad news. The realtor that sold us this place doesn't work at the company anymore, and they don't really have any files on hand about the previous owners. He whispered as I joined him. What? Nothing? Not even a forward address? All the agent can tell me for sure is this property has been in the market for six years. And we got it at a reduced price because it wasn't selling. I covered my mouth, realizing that such a simple thing could have horrific implications now. Had the wall actually consumed poor little Jasper too? Has she told you anything yet? Only that she's scared, and that I don't know how the house communicates yet. I paused and sighed deeply, trying not to lose it. Are we even listening to ourselves? I said in exasperation. Are we really expecting this house to talk to us? It exhausted traditional means. Medicine isn't working. Machinery won't break down the wall. And we saw that priest disappear before our eyes. We can't deny this is real. As though to prove his point, he walked over to the wall and began to bark a few commands. Listen to me. I know you can hear me because what you've done to my daughter. She's innocent, you hear me? I demand you take me instead. Of course, there was no response. Instead, Marcy only complained that her pain was returning and she felt itchy again. Still, I don't know what that meant in the connection to the house, but Stan was growing frustrated. What do you want from us? I swear to God, answer me now before I... I, I'd fucking burn you to the ground! Now that... That evoked a response from the wall, or rather Marcy, as she screamed again and yelled, It's pulling me! I instantly grabbed at her arm. No, please, please don't! He didn't mean it! I begged. Marcy's right nostril was now within the wall, and all of her right eye, only a sliver of her mouth, was out enough for her to cry to us. Then it seemed to stop, and I shoved Stan back. Are you crazy? Do you want to lose her altogether? He ignored me and went back to his office. I stood there for a moment, comforting Marcy. And I even gently touched the wall and muttered an apology. Please, just tell us what you want. We'll do it, anything. Just please let our little girl go. I slumped to the floor, and I kept staring at the paneling, expecting any sort of response. But neither Marcy nor the wall were showing any signs of talking. Was it angry because of Stan's threat? I went upstairs to confront him again. He was in his office searching for something amid our many boxes that we never got around to sorting, and I muttered, Stan, I know this sounds crazy, but we have to try to appease the house. We've tried that. We can't bring back the old residents. So I'm tired of compromising with a, a fucking demon, he said as he finally found what he was looking for. It was a sledgehammer. Stan, what are you doing? It thinks I'm bluffing. 
I'll show it what real pain is, he said. His face told me that he was serious, but I could see pain and anger in his eyes. He wasn't thinking this through. He walked back downstairs to the den. You can't. You said it yourself. It'll hurt her more than it helps. We know that some parts of the house can be hurt. If this thing wants to survive, it's going to have to start cooperating. He snarled as he turned to the wall and began to smash it apart. Instantly, Marcy began to holler. We could see that it was causing her little body to seize up. Don't do this. I'm not stopping until it lets her go, Stan said firmly. You hear that? I'm fucking tearing you down. I ran downstairs, desperate to try to hold on to Marcy before the wall started pulling again. If you keep this up, she'll be gone, I screamed. It's her or the house. If it takes her, I won't stop until the whole place is rubble. I squeezed my daughter's hand, trying to keep her from feeling the pain, but instead of, instead of pulling her further into the wall, the house had a different response this time. I could see it happening even before she started to make a sound. Something was moving under her skin. It was a small, gentle ripple against her arm before I realized that it was an insect, a, a termite, burrowing its way out of my daughter's arm. And before, before I knew what was happening, more of the insects began to dig themselves out of her body in different places. Stand, stand, stop! I shouted at the top of my lungs. This time, my husband listened. He dropped the sledgehammer and fell to his knees as he saw the termite swarm that was now invading our little girl's body. Dear Jesus, he muttered as he hurried to clean her off and get the insects away, but who knew how many of them were still inside of her? Another few minutes passed with nothing but Marcy's gentle sobs. Eventually she fell asleep and Stan and I stood there, broken, defeated by the house. Why is this happening? My husband asked, as he got down on his knees and started to plead at the house. I don't know what you want. I'm sorry, I just... I want my daughter back. Please, for the love of... Of all that's holy in the world, please... Give me a sign, he said. I squeezed his hand and we waited there, trying to see if anything would happen. Instead, it was just more silence. Stan stood up, shaking his head as he prepared to go back upstairs. Mama, do you feel that? Marcy whispered as we stood up. She looked confused, but not frightened. I looked toward her. Feel what, sweetie? I felt like something pushing its way out, she said. And that was when I noticed it. I, I approached the wall and reached my hand out to touch the gentle ripples in the pattern. There were five of them, all together, jutting out from the wall about six feet from where Marcy was stuck. As I watched, in awestruck horror, the wall began to peel away and showed what appeared to be five little fingers sticking out. I don't know what I'm doing anymore. This house is affecting everyone that comes in contact with it. The house is alive, and whether you choose to believe that or not, I don't care. What matters is... is that I'm going to do whatever is necessary to save my daughter. Even if I don't fully understand. When this started, my husband and I resorted to different methods to try to break our daughter free. We even attempted to contact a priest. That led to the house retaliating. And now, as crazy as it sounds, we're trying to appease the house to save her. But she isn't alone anymore. Over the course of a single afternoon, Stan and I watched as the small fingers that we saw pushing out from the wall formed into a complete hand. And then, a wrist. Someone or something was trying to to push its way out of the wall. Somehow Stan got his brother back on the phone. Tim has a friend that works third shift to try to help us before all this got so bad, but I pushed her away. I've had time to reconsider that decision, and I've realized the house has been clouding my judgment. I need all the help I can get. Look, about before... I want to apologize, the nurse said over the phone. 
I found out her name was Beth. Beth had two kids of her own. I know you're stressed. Anyone would be. It's a matter of life and death, and it's something that no one has ever seen before. Look, I'm no Christian, but if you are, I'd recommend praying to God, because what you've told me since I left sounds like you're dealing with the devil himself. I learned that she risked her job to help us the first time, and that now, as she re-entered this hell, she was willing to do so again. All because of a hand sticking out of a wall. I never believed the rumors. Not until this, Beth admitted, as she used a tourniquet to tie off the edge of the wrist closest to the wall. I saw that she was hesitant to touch the building itself. Rumors? Stan asked. He had been tending to Marcy. Ever since the incident with the termites, her body had been sore and had a variety of open sores on her arm and belly. She was exhausted and barely breathing. Beth made no comment about her state of being, but instead focused all of the attention on the new arm. Local stuff. About this house being haunted. And you can read up on a few tabloid articles about it here and there, but it's almost like the house is keeping a secret. Like, okay, let's say this boy is really trapped here, so why would the house release him now? Beth asked. I didn't have an answer for that question. All I knew was that I was certain that Jasper was a key to this whole mess, and I wanted to learn as much about him as possible. After making sure the tourniquet was good and tight, Beth took out a scalpel and gently cut the tip of the finger. Then she used a needle to draw blood and commented, Guess either way, I'll get an answer soon enough. Once she was finished, she checked on Marcy's vitals and gave us more bad news. Her body's starting to shut down. Her breathing is becoming labored, and now that more than half of her is inside the house, it doesn't... It doesn't appear that she has any way of using the bathroom. She admitted as she checked Marcy and confirmed she also had a fever. Then we might... It might be too late. Stan realized. At this point, who knows? I can't definitively say what's going to happen. Beth pursed her lips as though she wanted to say something, but stood up and sighed before adding, I'll call you when I get the results back. God be with you. I thanked her and let her go as Stan paced in the hallway. Considering our options, Marcy was asleep now thanks to a few pills that Beth had given her, and my husband used these moments as a chance for us to discuss what we would do if the house continued to wreak havoc on our little girl's body. I don't think this is going to end well, he admitted, as he slumped in his favorite recliner. We can't give up on her. If that little boy is any indication, maybe even if she is completely absorbed... She'll be alive still, I said. Stan didn't seem so sure. You heard the nurse. Her body's breaking down. Who's to say even if she could come out that it would be for very long? She's lost what little will she has to survive. I... I think... I, th I think that maybe we're just delaying the inevitable. I ran my fingers through my hair trying to deny what he was telling me. But I knew he was right. Our daughter was dying. It wasn't a matter of if, but when. Maybe she should at least go with some dignity then. But little she has left. These past few days have been nothing but pain for her, Stan. But look at her now. She's... She's at peace. I said with a soft smile. The medicine likely will wear off in a few hours. If we're... If we're going to come to terms with saying goodbye, then we have a small window here to decide how we want to say goodbye, he said softly. I nodded and I walked down the hall, staring at Jasper's hand and wondering if his parents faced a similar predicament years ago. How could any parent ever prepare themselves for anything of this magnitude? It was unfathomable. I, 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 I need some fresh air, I told Stan. Before we had a chance to object, I grabbed my purse and left the house for the first time in days. I got into the car and I just drove, not really caring where. I left our neighborhood and eventually found myself at a park about 19 blocks away. It was one of the ones that Marcy used to love to play at. As I stopped the car and stared blankly at strangers that were enjoying the afternoon air, I found myself feeling even more depressed. What was I doing? 
I was treating her like she was already dead. Why would I do that? I can't stop now. I have to keep fighting for her. She's my daughter. The phone buzzed off and it made me jump as I saw it was Beth calling me back. Hey, sorry for the delay. I got the results back and they're, they're a bit inconclusive. I guess we should have expected that given the fact that the kid probably has all kinds of stuff going on inside his body, but it's definitely strong vitals. He's alive and he's healthy. So that's something she told me. I told her that was good news and asked what should be our next step. She mirrored what Stan had said earlier. I think as as cruel as uh, as this sounds, you may need to consider a way to gently let Marcy go. I don't, I don't know the connection here, but it may be the house that's feeding off her in order to restore this boy, and it may be impossible to save them, them both, she told me. Definitely not the news I wanted to hear, but... Then she said something else I found interesting. Honestly, though, I don't really mean that. I mean, I'm a mom, and I know that if one of my kids were in that thing, I would I would do whatever I could to save them, even if all hope is lost, Beth admitted. I thanked her. I told her that if we needed her for anything again, we would call. After the phone call ended, I stared at the screen for a moment and thought about Marcy. Why was the house taking so long to consume her? There was no hope at all. It, it didn't feel right. Nothing about what was happening did, though. On a whim, I went to the internet to our local newspaper article and started searching for anything on the house. There wasn't a single article. But then I searched Jasper Hunt. And that was more interesting. Local boy missing for days. Family suspected of homicide. Local residents are up in arms about a 10-year-old boy that's been missing for nearly three days now. Parents have stayed adamant that they have no idea what happened to their son, but local authorities have found evidence to suggest that he may have been murdered in the house that they reside in. I kept scrolling, touching on articles that related on the case. Noah Hunt, charged with first-degree murder in cold case related to his son. The morning residents of our sleepy town can breathe a sigh of relief as a traumatic chapter comes to a close, surrounding the disappearance of a 10-year-old Jasper Hunt. Last summer, Jasper went missing near to the family home and subsequent search parties proved unable to find him. Results in the case being turned over to homicide after the suicide of Jasper's mother. Now, after continuously standing by his innocence, Noah Hunt, the father and husband in this ill-fated tale, has confessed to first-degree murder and to hiding Jasper's body inside the walls of his three-bedroom house. Mr. Hunt is being offered a plea deal by the district attorney in exchange for the exact location of where he buried Jasper. I felt a chill run down my spine as I read the quote made by Jasper's father. Quote, you're not going to be able to find him. He's part of the house now. I made sure of that, Mr. Hunt said. Construction teams are waiting for an approval warrant by the judge to begin tearing down the property in order to give poor Jasper a proper burial. I read another brief snippet that told me Noah was being held at the county correctional facility, and before I really had time to think about what I was doing, I started to drive there. About halfway to the downtown area, my phone buzzed again. It was Stan. I let it go to speakerphone. Where are you? He asked. I'm sorry, I just... I need some time to myself, I told him. Please come back, I... <laughs> I can't do this without you, he admitted. I frowned as I turned the next corner. Stan, what is it that you plan to do? I... I found my, my dad's old service pistol in the basement. It's a little old, but I think it'll do the trick. I clenched the wheel a little harder. Please, please don't do this, I told him. I don't want her to suffer anymore. Stan, she's our daughter. You said it yourself. Time to say goodbye while we still have a chance. No, Stan, it's the house. Get out of the house before... The line went dead. I turned the car around and I stepped on the accelerator. Noah would have to wait. I'm sorry for the way I ended my last update, but I had little time to spare. 
My daughter Marcy has been stuck, becoming a part of my house that my husband Stan and I have been mortgaging now for days. First it started with her hand, then it pulled her in further, it ate a priest, and it retaliated when we tried to smash it apart. I thought we had exhausted all options by this point, but I was wrong. We've been wrong this entire time. And now that I can speak with a level head, I can get the story straight. I called Tim as I raced to the house and told him what his brother was about to do. Jesus, you need to call the cops, Tim told me. I thought of the power that that house seemed to exert over anyone that came close to it. No, we can't let this thing hurt more people. It controls anyone that steps foot inside, but I need your help. I think now I can fight it, but I'll need you, Tim. You know him better than anyone, I shouted. Tim promised that he would get there as soon as possible, and I mentally crossed my fingers. That would be soon enough. When I got to the house, I ran inside to see Stan was still struggling with his decision to end our daughter's life. Marcy had her eyes closed as she was still resting, and I could see little Jasper's face beginning to push its way out of the wall. I have made it. Stan, you have to stop before it's too late, I said, as his eyes drifted up to catch a glimpse of me at the end of the hall. I didn't want you to be here to see this, he said. His hands were shaky. He was pointing the gun towards our daughter's head. It made me think of Noah Hunt. Had the house tried to force him to do this years ago? Get a hold of yourself! Don't you see the house is controlling you? It's been, it's been doing that to both of us, to everyone that's ever come here, he said as I took a step forward. He cocked the gun. Please don't come any closer. You're not going to talk me out of this. Listen to yourself. Listen to yourself. You want to put a bullet in our little girl's head. Even if she was dying, there's other humane ways to do this. Why resort to violence? The house is clouding your judgment. I told him as I took my smartphone out and added, The same thing happened to Jasper's father. He nearly killed his son. As I was speaking behind Stan, I could see that Jasper was still pushing his way out of the wall. Facial features were forming, and he was looking like a real boy again. Look at him, Stan. He's hes not dead. That's proof enough right there. The house consumed him, and it drove his mother and father insane. I got down on my knees, and I slid my phone down the hallway to where my husband stood. At least look at the article, please, I said. Inwardly, my mind was doing tricks with itself already. It was a whirlwind of emotions when part of me was hearing a buzzing noise that was growing in my head, telling me to encourage his suicidal mission. I knew it had to be the house. Its demonic presence was working hard to sway me back to being under its control. Stan looked down at the phone, nervous and sweaty. He kept a firm grip on his pistol as he picked it up and looked at the articles about Jasper and about his father. I waited, knowing that the house would convince him of another lie, and behind me I heard Tim open the door. He was about to rush his brother, but I held him back. The chances of either Marcy or Jasper getting hurt were just too great. Hey bro, it's me. I, I don't know what you're thinking, but this isn't the answer. Right? There's always another way. We'll find uh, another priest. We'll sacrifice a goat. Now, heck, we'll even bring the military to tear this place down, Tim said. Those words seemed to snap Stan back to reality. This time he pointed the gun towards Jasper. His eyes were closed. It was, it was as though the house had consumed him in some kind of coma. One has to die for the other to live. That's what... That's what the voice in my head is telling me, Stan admitted. Don't listen to it! They can both live! Don't let this place take you too! I begged. Stan was sweating even more now, looking in between the children. Then he slowly raised the gun up and pointed it at us again. The house needs something in return for both of their lives. You're talking crazy, okay? Give us the gun! Sam tried to step forward, but my husband let a bullet graze the floor as I stopped in my tracks to wait and see if the house would retaliate. The way it remained silent now told me all I needed to know about what was happening. The house wanted my daughter dead. We can save them both, Stan said, and then smiled awkwardly. I can save them both. 
Even as the words left his lips, I knew what he was planning to do. Tim tried to make a move too. We barely made it halfway down the hall. Sam placed the barrel of the gun in his mouth. A tear fell down his face as he pulled the trigger. Everything happened so fast, I can't remember the finer details. Stan's skull burst from the top with blood spattering against the wall, and the house began to absorb him almost instantly. His body slipped through the plaster and into the unknown, with only his bottom part sticking out. I, I screamed out his name. Tim and I ran even though it was already over. The house was pulling him in. At the same moment, for the first time in days, my daughter was becoming whole. Stan's sacrifice had worked somehow, and I, I hugged her neck as Tim helped Jasper and neither of them really breathing well, though, I realized. All I could do was stifle the tears as I watched my husband disappear into the house as a sacrifice for those two. And, and then I pulled Marcy up and I started to move outside the house. As soon as Tim and I were outside, we called the police in the hospital. This time they responded instantly. I thought of all the time the house had impeded us in its desperate attempt for us to kill ourselves. I thought about all the ways that it had controlled everyone who came close to it. And in the end, how my husband had to sacrifice himself for all of us to be free. Tim and I told the first responders a different story, though. How that the space between the walls was used to hold Jasper hostage for the past six years. I detested this story, though, because it was a narrative that painted my husband as a child molester and a killer, but there wasn't much alternative. They would never believe the truth. Now the house was quiet. It was satisfied with all the chaos it had brought into our lives. But I wasn't. There was still one wrong I felt I could make right. So I arranged for Tim to watch Marcy. And I went down to the correctional facility as planned. I felt it would make the most sense hearing it from me. Someone who dealt with the same trauma. And when I saw him being brought in behind the glass to speak to me, I knew that he had suffered for too long. Who are you? He asked. I told him. And I explained how I owned the house that he once lived in. That seemed to spark a little light in his eyes. So, who did you lose? Noah wondered. That's what I came to tell you. I didn't lose anyone. I saved them. I saved my daughter... And I saved your son, too. He's, he's in the county clinic right now. Noah frowned. He didn't seem as excited as I hoped. That isn't possible. No, it's true. CPS is going to put Jasper in a foster home until your sentence is commuted. I'll even speak for you at your next parole hearing if you need. My son is dead. I shot him myself. To save him from that house. Mr. Hunt said, and leaned forward as he saw confusion written on my face. You killed him? I repeated slowly, the words making sense. We both sat there in silence as we realized. What had happened? And you let it out. To go to another house. To spread... <laughs> he laughed loudly and reared his head back. I felt an emptiness in my bones. It was always a trap. <laughs> always. Hey there once again, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you so much for watching tonight's video, or, you know, 
listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. This is the same thing I say at the end of every video all the time. So I think it kind of goes without saying that I appreciate you and I appreciate you guys sticking around. We're moving into some of the hottest months of the year, which means that it's probably a good thing if some of you guys start to cool down a bit. A great way to do that, iced tea, sweet iced tea. You know, I'm from Texas is what we do. And my wife sells tea. Etsy.com slash shop slash ivory monocle tea to get a whole bunch of different kinds of teas, even creepy pasta based teas. And if you ask for the MCP dabbing sticker, you get a special one that nobody else gets. <laughs> and as always, I want to give a very huge thank you to all of my supporters out there on Patreon. I say this every time, but I truly mean it. You guys are the real MVPs. And without you, I don't think I would be able to continue doing this at the capacity that I do, especially not as many brand new custom stories as we've been getting just for the channel. So a very special thank you to Jacob Schaefer, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Arce, Ken Landa Higuchi, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Kraus, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Blitzkrieg, Bardo Hawk 764, The Banana Mafia 1, Hollow Hero, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Katie Birch, Sashi Sazaku, Caden the Spooky Boy, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Faya Lockett, Miss Alexandra, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Robert White, Legit Quad Feed, Fried Chicken 12, James Bruce, Freddy Krueger, Ty Nanny, Infernal One, James Lowe, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Paulson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys once again so, so much. And if you would like to join this list of people's names that I mispronounce, or the list of people's names that are down there in the description, check out patreon.com slash Mr. Creepy Pasta. And as always, a very sweet dreams to all of you. Good night, folks.